Okay, so does anyone happen to know what anatomy or phys physiology actually means? Okay, study of form and function. Anatomy is a Latin term. And if you parse the term, it actually means to cut apart. And so this is going to basically be the way in which we can analyze relationships in living organisms. And now, primarily this class is going to be sort of a human anatomy type class. But, in all reality, anatomy can be studied on a whole variety of different critters. We could look at the anatomy of starfish, or the anatomy of bears, or the anatomy of Bryce Killer's little brother, who's just kidding. So, we can look at anatomy of a bunch of different types of organisms or critters, and it would be just simply looking at the form and the structure. Okay, so the form and the structure. How about physiology? The second part of the class, and everybody usually is like, oh yeah, i got to go to anatomy class. Well, you're going to anatomy and physiology. So what actually is physiology? So I think I heard how it works. So if anatomy is form and structure, physiology is going to be function. So the study of function. So combined, we can couple together the form and the function. And really what happens here is the way that something looks ends up defining how that actually works. And so the anatomy is going to really define the physiology. OK, so now that we got these basic definitions, what can we actually do to begin to assess or study anatomy. And I'm going to take this in two different levels. We can study gross anatomy, and in a minute here we'll talk about studying microanatomy. Gross anatomy is going to be large scale, what you call macro, or visible with the naked eye. So we are able to see things with the uh, naked eye, or the unaided eye, and you have all experienced this before. When you go to the doctor, the doctor does a variety of different things to you, and he's just simply studying your anatomy. What you're looking at here is not a massage. This is actually a technique of inspection. And there's a couple different types of inspection. Inspection is really what we do when we use our senses. To investigate. So we're going to use our senses to investigate some aspect of anatomy. What you're looking at here is called palpation. Now I want to make sure that we don't get this confused with another very similar term which is palpitation which you get with your heart. It's kind of that racing feeling of your heart as a palpitation. This is palpation. And what we're doing here is we're actually going to be using our hands and induce pressure from our hands to investigate, to see what's going on. Is the liver distended below the 12th rib? Uh, maybe we have some hardening of the tissue, uh, or, or we can actually feel, uh, I don't know, subcutaneous uh, uh, emphysema, air in the subcutaneous tissue. And we're actually using our hands and pressure to feel that. So we can use other senses as well. We can actually use our sense of hearing. And when we do that, typically it's with use of a stethoscope, and we can listen to the heart, or we can listen to the, uh, the lung sounds or the digestive sounds. And this is oscillation. And so when they actually listen to your heart and uh, listen to the beat of the heart, they're using the sense of hearing to listen to a wide variety of body sounds. So a wide variety of body sounds, heart rates, digestive noises. Okay? And I got a picture of that as well. It's a dog, not some hairy guy. Um, just listening to probably German Shepherd here, listening to the beat and the apex of the heart. 
Now we can also use a technique, and this is actually pretty interesting. And it's called percussion, and most of you should recognize that as a musical term. These are the instruments like drums and piano, where you actually use some sort of implement to hit a string or a, uh, uh, a drum head or something like that. Well, in terms of uh, anatomy and physiology, we are tapping, just like we would with a percussive instrument. We are going to tap to reverberate sound. And what we actually can do is we can begin to use the sounds that get reverberated back to us to differentiate between what's soft tissue and what's hard tissue. We actually can hear differences in certain types of tissue, uh, like the liver if it begins to descend on. Not only can we feel it and kind of cup our hand up underneath it, but it actually sounds a little bit different uh, than it really should. I got a picture here of percussion as well. Uh, again, not really a massage here. We're actually looking probably for fluid in the lungs, would be my guess, in these images. Okay, so these are all very non-invasive techniques, right? We don't have to do any sort of cutting or anesthesia or anything like that for this sort of uh, investigation of anatomy, but we can actually begin to get a little bit more invasive. And there's a couple different techniques that we can use to begin to investigate the deeper gross anatomy. What's no longer just surface of the skin, but what's deeper. And two of those techniques are going to be dissection and vivisection. They are two different things, and I'm going to differentiate here in just a second. These are techniques where we're going to cut apart and then evaluate. So we'll cut apart and we'll begin to evaluate relationships. That's evaluate relationships. Now, dissection is going to be done on animals that are deceased or individuals that are deceased. Okay, so we have a picture of a sprog dolly rat here that has been, well, his jacket's been taken off. In humans, medical schools and a few very large undergraduate institutions still use dissection in their anatomy curriculum, and it's going to be on human cadavers. And the human cadaver obviously is a dead individual, an individual who's deceased, who's donated their body for this specific purpose. Yeah. So we're having to relationships. So we're cutting apart and evaluating relationships. So humans, uh, we can look at human cadavers. Uh, in the past, and you're going to do some comparative work in this class, you can invest, investigate some of you can investigate some of uh, the anatomical relationships that would exist with comparative anatomy. And so this would be a fetal pig or a cat or a frog as a surrogate uh, for the anatomy that we may run into in humans, understanding that there are certainly going to be some differences, right? There's going to be some differences between the musculature of a cat and a biped like a human. So that's going to be dissection. Now vivisection, vivisection is um, not routinely done anymore, and you're going to really understand why here in just a second. Vivisection is done on live conscious individuals, especially animals, although there have been some examples of vivisection done on humans. So we don't routinely do this anymore. Part of it is because there's a real ethical problem with this. Um, we don't like to induce pain unnecessarily, and we can get the same information if we just simply either uh, humanely euthanize the animal or if we just use animals or humans that have already deceased from some other cause. So again, vivisection not routinely done. Used to be done quite a bit more uh, in the past. Now, another technique that used to be a lot more common than it is now 
is exploratory surgery. Uh, and exploratory surgery, it's actually become pretty obsolete in humans. It's actually much more common in animals, especially animals used in research. Um, the whole idea here is to just go in and explore what's maybe going on or explore the anatomy, uh, typically for purposes of correction, to correct some sort of pathophysiology to uh, reinstitute normal physiology. Uh, and why has it gone obsolete in humans? Well, it's because we've had some superb advances in imaging and radiology. So we've had great uh, advances in things like CT scans and PET scans and NMR and MRIs and all of these imaging techniques. Uh, so here's an example. We can see um, this is actually looking for cellular activity. We're doing a scan to look for localizations of oncocells, cancer-causing cells. Basically, we're looking to see where the tumors are. Uh, and so we use a couple different techniques, can overlay the variety of different types of imaging and radiology to get massive amounts of information, very valuable information. Again, uh, very in, uh, non-invasive, but also kind of expensive. Okay, so that's all of our uh, gross anatomy, looking at what's going on with the unaided eye. But we can also observe anatomy on a much smaller level. We can observe anatomy in what's called the micro scale. Now, microanatomy, again, this is going to be typically done with some sort of microscopy from low resolution techni techniques like light microscopy all the way through high resolution techniques like electron microscopy. And what we're going to do here is we are going to look at tissues and organs and cells at a variety of different levels. And if we observe, which we're going to do on Friday, the level of the tissue where we have multiple different types of cells that are uh, conglomerated together, we're actually uh, assessing or analyzing histology. So histology, really what we're doing here is we take thin slices of tissue and then we use microscopes. Microscopy, typically something like light microscopy up to about a thousand times magnification. So how do we actually get thin slices? Well, these thin slices that are going to be produced, we basically take our organ or our tissue of interest and we snap freeze it to about minus 120 degrees centigrade in a, uh, a, a medium that helps us to be able to cut it. Then we have a specialized piece of equipment that has a very sharp blade, and you just rotate this big crank, and it makes these tiny little sections up to uh, as low as about a micron in, um, in thickness, and then you put them on a microscope slide, and you're cutting them that thin because you want to be able to pass light through. And then you get images that look like this. And really what you're looking at here is the intestinal wall, probably the duodenum or the, uh, the uh, jejunum. And you can see a variety of different cell types as we move towards the very inside or inner portion of that particular histological section. So we can study anatomy in this form as well. But we can actually go even deeper. This is, remember, I mean, we may have a million cells in this picture. We can go down to the level of the cell, and when we do that, we actually are beginning to look at cytology. And this is really going to be aimed at analyzing the structure and, in some cases, the function of individual cells. Uh, so really, in your mind, you should be thinking uh, along the, the, in terms of molecular biology, cellular biology techniques. But we don't want to stop there. We don't want to just get down to the level of the cell. We actually want to go further. And if we do go further than that and begin to look at components inside of the cell, 
we're beginning to look at its ultra structure. It's ultra structure. And basically, what we're doing here with ultra structure is we're now looking at the very minute details of the cell. And so we're dealing with things like individual molecules, individual proteins or carbohydrates or lipids or nucleic acids inside of the cell. We're getting at the molecular evaluation. And most of the time, ultrastructure is going to require really high expensive, high, high resolution expensive microscopy, things like electron microscopes. So that was histology. Here's a look at cytology, looking at individual cells. Now we're at probably over a thousand mag times magnification in this picture. And then we get down to the very intricate workings of individual cells with electron microscopy. Now does it really look like that? That's called a false color image and we just basically colored it that way to help make some contrast. So what you're looking at here is you're actually looking at <clears throat> some bacteria but a lot of this is proteinaceous structures inside of a clot. So we can actually get down to that detail in even more detail. Okay, so a lot of stuff going on here from the very large to the very, very small and a variety of different techniques that we can use to study anatomy. <clears throat> How about physiology? How do we actually study physiology? The number one way in which physiology is being studied is through experimentation. With experimentation, we're going to use things like the scientific method. And that scientific method requires us to design and test a hypothesis. And so you've already had a little bit of experience with this. Uh, last Wednesday we looked at designing a hypothesis and then we worked through the testing of that hypothesis. So when we look at physiology experimentation, humans can be invo involved. We can actually do some experimentation on humans, but there are ethical considerations and ethical limits. We can extend our experimentation by actually looking at other organisms besides humans. And when we do that, just like we had comparative anatomy, we can also look at comparative physiology. So comparative physiology. Now, comparative anatomy versus comparative physiology, both of them are comparing other organisms. So with comparative physiology, we're actually doing this to get past these ethical limits. And in fact, most research has to start in some sort of model organism. The most common model organism that we utilize are actually mice and rats. In the United States right now, we're using about 1.5 million mice every year in research, uh, and about the same number of rats, about a million rats. Okay? So we're actually looking at comparative physiology, and we are getting beyond ethical limits. Now, even though we're getting beyond these ethical limits, there are some additional limitations that come along with this. Human physiology is not identical to mouse physiology, or rat physiology, or dog physiology, or monkey physiology. There are inherent differences. So this is just simply a starting point. And you might have some biological pathway that's your favorite biological pathway, and you might study that for a long time. Maybe you make most of your career out of it, but eventually this is where we have to go. We're not trying to save mice, plain and simple. We are using mice to look at human health or to be a surrogate for human health. So eventually we got to go and take a look at humans 
But first, we got to sidestep these ethical considerations. In my own work, in my own <laughs> field of research, we typically don't remove the testicles of humans just to see what happens. But in mice, we actually can do that. All right, everybody have all of this? Is everybody keeping up okay? All right, so with that introduction to anatomy and physiology, how do we study it? How do we look at both of them? Um, there's a couple things that we need to consider here that should be, for the most part, revealed. Okay, we're going to start some of this review material with a concept called structural hierarchy. Okay, so structural hierarchy. And really what structural hierarchy is, is it's a bio biological concept where we have increasing levels of complexity in structure from the very least complex thing called a subatomic particle all the way up to the most complex thing which would be things like a whole ecosystem or virus. Okay, so in this class in uh, physiology, anatomy and physiology, BI312 at Truman McConnell College, really we're going to be worried about what's happening with electrons, protons, and neutrons. What's happening at the subatomic particle and we're going to go through atoms and we're going to go through molecules and macromolecules and organelles and organs or cells, tissues, organs and organ systems, and then the whole organism. And that's really our framework that we're going to work from. We're not going to deal with complex predator-prey relationships because I have to find that boring. Mm -hmm. We're going to deal with the really interesting stuff, which is anatomy and physiology. And you can take that to Mr. Hennigan and tell him that I said that. <laughs> So if you don't really, if you're not really completely familiar with a figure like this that shows our hierarchy of biological order, it's a good thing that you're going to want to review. And we make it up to about here in this class, and we forget all the higher. I mean, that's why it's just called higher levels, because that's all that really matters. Just everything else in biology is higher levels of piled higher and deeper. Another review concept is uh, this difference between what's known as reductionism and holism. Now, reductionism versus holism, these are basically two different approaches to any complex system, whether it's a biological pathway or the engine of your car complex systems, and we can approach them either using a reductionist approach or a holistic approach. Now, you will agree that the human body and the physiology and anatomy of organisms is a complex system. And you have a textbook that's basically an abbreviated version of anatomy and physiology. There are about 75 other books that we could add on to really look at the complete picture of anatomy and physiology. And even then, we're still not covering everything. Okay, so it's a very complex, com uh, a very complex system that we're trying to study. And we can apply either of these pro approaches: holism or reductionism. Reductionism just like it in its name alludes to, we're going to reduce the whole system into individual parts. We're going to reduce it to individual parts that hopefully are going to be simpler. Now, from these simpler parts, we'll begin to look at their functions and maybe their anatomy, and maybe we can begin to build an understanding of what's going on. So the picture you're looking at here, this is from a, a, a book, a relatively well-known book, on holism and reductionism. And you can see that the reductionism is basically the individual components of the elephant. You got the leg, and you got, I think that's the tail, and the ears, and the trunk. And so you might have one person who studies the trunk, and one person who studies the ear, and one person who studies the tail. 
So we're reducing the complexities of the elephant to its individual parts. Now, obviously, it's not just simply, okay, you're going to be uh, the anatomist uh, for the leg of the human, but it's talking about, okay, I'm really interested in what's going on in mitochondrial function in the skeletal muscle cell during exercise. And so you might spend your entire life studying mitochondrial function. What's going on with the enzymes? What kind of molecules are, are moving across the, the mitochondrial membrane? So you're reducing it down. And really, you're not looking at the whole picture. Now, in all reality, reductionism is the way most scientists study biology. And it has led to phenomenal discoveries. We know how to actually cure diseases now because of reductionist research. We know how to deal with huge biological pathways and huge amounts of genetic information because of reductionism. The other possibility is holism. And this is to look at the whole elephant. We're going to look at the whole biological system. What holism requires or relies on, I guess I should say, is what's known as emergent properties. So to give you an example, first, uh, I guess to expand on this and then to give you a, a little bit of demonstration by example, emergent properties, these are going to be arguably unpredictable from the parts. Okay, so the argument here is that it's such a complex system that we can really not gain a whole lot of information from the individual parts on how the whole organism or the whole biological system is actually going to function. Rather, we say, let's put it all together and we're going to say that we have these properties that emerge when the whole organism or the whole biological pathway is considered. And so they actually emerge from the more complex. And so let me give you an example. So, what is that? Well, it's a line. But what if I was drawing a biological, biological uh, item, some sort of uh, an anatomical item? And I said, well, that's actually a quill. From this quill, this bird feather that I'm eventually going to draw here, from the quill, you would never guess that's a flight, uh, a flight anatomical element. This is an element that's going to be involved in, in flight. And so then I begin to add in additional information, and pretty soon we're going to get to the level of the whole feather, and you're going to see the whole feather, and you're going to see that, hey, actually this maybe is going to be usable for flight. Put all those feathers together, and I get the wing, and now all of a sudden you're saying, yeah, this is really going to be used for flight. So it's not until we start to put everything together as we approach this holistic uh, kind of idea that you begin to see that there are really properties that are emerging. I need a quill to fly, but on its own, it's not going to be able to be predicted to be part of a flying mechanism. Okay? So maybe I'm making the case right now, and you're all going, well, why don't we study things holistically? Why don't we take a holistic approach? And there's some people, even on this campus, who would suggest that science shouldn't be done unless we look at it from a holistic approach. But herein lies the problem. And it's a great problem. And it's a problem that has not been solved. When you study the whole system, you're looking at complex networks of information that are so complex that they overrun our computers, our greatest supercomputers. And so can we actually study the whole system? The answer is probably not. It is probably impossible. So we have to have at least some form of reductionism to be able to break down the complexity enough so that we can handle it with the technology and the intelligence that we have. So we just don't have the type of computing power that would be required. We fall awfully short of sort of that horizon, if you will. Even with some massive amounts of computing power that we have, we have some supercomputers, uh, even in this country, that are 
huge. Compared to where we were 50 years ago, our computing power is bucos and bucos beyond what we've ever had. And we're still struggling to, to fully analyze the 3.5 billion nucleotides, which would be a reductionist question, right? Reducing it down to just the genome. We're still struggling to answer simple genomic questions. Yeah. The problem is this, like, that I guess it's possible to pass and like, why is, why is it a thing? Like, what would you use it for? Because the argument is that when we reduce, we're missing out on, on, on the complexity. And within that complexity, inherent in that complexity is some very important biology. That's true. Absolutely, it's true. So, how do we get from there, from reductionism to holism? It's going to require additional computing power. It's going to require additional intelligence. I mean, literally, this is the question I, I believe, and I'm sort of on my soapbox right now, so to speak, where we would have to stand on the, stand on the shoulders of the men who stood on the shoulders of the men who stood on the shoulders of, of giants. So we can look way beyond what we've ever seen before in science, and we're just not there. Okay, so hopefully you've run into reductionism and holism before. Uh, and if not, again, that would be a nice place for you to maybe just take a little bit of review. Not spend a whole lot of time, but take a look at uh, just a, a little bit. Um, another concept here that's uh, now a, not really so much review anymore, but it is a, a, a key concept to begin in any anatomy and physiology class with, is this idea of anatomical variation. So when you typically study anatomy and physiology in an undergraduate anatomy and physiology sequence course like AMP 1 and 2, you get a big long list, which you have, of anatomical items, and you've got to learn where they are. You have to be able to identify those things. And the list and all of the pictures in your book, for the most part, are going to be what's called normal anatomy. So you're going to be learning the normal. You're going to be learning normal anatomy because it is what's most common. It's, it's, it's normal not in the sense that, oh yeah, he's really normal. It's normal because it's what shows up in most of us. Most of us have five fingers. In fact, I think everybody in the room has five fingers. And if you don't have five fingers, it's probably because you cut one off when you were mowing the lawn. But you usually were born with five fingers. So that's the normal anatomy. And there are uh, a total of uh, 14 bones for most people in those five digits on each hand. So that's what we learn, that normal anatomy. But we have to be aware that there are individual differences. Now, these individual differences that show up in anatomy are known as deviant anatomy. Simply put, it means that they deviate from what is most common or what we consider to be normal. And there are a variety of examples that we could point to. It's not how you spell kidney. But there are a variety of different types of kidneys. Most people have two kidneys on either side of their, um, uh, of their body cavity, and they look like a kidney. But there are some people who have a kidney that is actually horseshoe shaped and it's just one whole kidney where two kidneys should exist but they're connected and so that would be deviant anatomy it deviates from what is normal if we look at the aorta which is what comes out of the top of the heart makes a nice bend it's called the aortic arch and then it begins to descend down sort of midline in the body through the abdomen there are branches that come off of them, are off of the aorta. Um, uh, the, one of them is brachiocephalic, and they normally come off just basically three in a line. Some people will have them come off in a variety of different directions. Okay, and so that's another example. Uh, the location of the bifurcation could be deviant from what is normal. What I think is probably the most interesting 
is a condition called Sitchis inversus. And this is actually, in this, in this case, it's totalis, meaning it's totally deviant. All of the organs are going to be flipped around mirror image. So your heart's over here, the liver points in a different direction, the three lobes of the lung, or the lung with three lobes is on one side, and it's on the opposite side now. So all, it just looks like someone just reached in there and just flipped everything around or reflected it in a mirror. Now this person is completely normal. So just because deviant anatomy exists doesn't necessarily mean that the individual has any sort of pathophysiology. Just one more example. Hyperphalangism. And this is going to be a type of anatomical variation in which the individual has more than five fingers on hand or more than five toes on a foot. So you have some extra bones in your fingers or even a whole extra finger. All right, so moving on. This is a biology class, right? So what is one of the things that we saw we should talk about in the introduction of the paper? What is biology? Study of life. So what should we probably define? We probably should define life. Now, the, the, the way to define life, in my opinion, is to actually give, I guess, credit to the complexity. We probably should have a pretty complex definition of life. Um, some people would say, oh, well, it's anything that happens in a cell. Well, okay, sure, but I think it's more complex than that. So I believe that life is going to have to be organized and maintained I, anyone remember that abbreviation? Energy. So we're going to have to organize and maintain life with energy. Now, collectively, anyone happen to know what all the chemical, collectively on all the chemical reactions are uh, occurring, what we would call that for an individual organism? It's the organisms, starts with an M, metabolism. Okay? So basically, life requires metabolism. And when we begin to look at metabolism, what we see is there are two types of metabolism. We have anabolism. And the way that you can remember this is anabolic steroids. What do anabolic steroids do? Why does Mark McGuire take anabolic steroids? <laughs> So it builds muscle, so it increases muscle size. So anabolism is going to be the metabolic processes that actually build or make molecules and other cellular organisms and things like that. So anabolism is building, so we can take the individual building block of glucose and we can shove it into the liver and produce a molecule called glucagon by taking a bunch of glucose molecules and stringing them all together in this big branch complex storage molecule called glucagon. So anabolism goes from simple, a molecule of glucose, to complex, a molecule of glucagon, which is many, many molecules of glucose. What's the other side? Anabolism and metabolism. And catabolic processes are going to be those processes that not build up, but rather break down. Okay, so we're going to begin to use sugar or glucose to generate our energy store in the cells, which is ATP. So we take glucose, we reorganize the electrons, we reorganize the the bonds and we begin to generate molecules like ATP. So in this case we're going from more complex 
to more simple. And usually what we're doing here is we're actually trying to liberate the energy that's stored in chemical bonds so that we can utilize that energy for anabolic processes. So I got to spin glucose to ATP to be able to put together proteins to form the actin in mice and that I find in a muscle cell. I got to be able to take glucose to ATP so I can build lipids to shove them into all my different plasma membranes inside of the cell. Now, building things up and breaking things down, we're always going to have byproducts, and usually we call those byproducts waste. So in addition to anabolism and catabolism, we're also going to have waste that needs to be managed. Okay, so we need waste management, and really what that means is we got to get rid of the stuff that is not really going to be used for anything that could just become a toxin. So life requires waste management, and we require systems that help us to do that. And we're going to, in a lot of cases, just simply urinate it out or poop it out. We're going to excrete it. Uh, in other cases, we will actually neutralize. the metabolites that are being produced. Okay, so life requires metabolism. You've got to organize and maintain with energy. Now this is a biggie. This is actually one of the tenets, uh, one of the tenets of the cell theory. Life is composed of cells. Okay, so if you take this definition as it is, that means viruses are not living organisms because they do not have cells. But a bacteria is because it's a single cell organism. So life requires cells. And I, I believe that. I think that viruses are something that can interact with living organisms, but is not itself a living organism. So cells, what about a mitochondria? Mitochondria is an organelle inside of a cell. Is it a living or uh, have any sort of living properties? No, but collectively, the Golgi complex, the endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes, lysosomes, peroxisomes, all of these other organelles put together, wrapped up in a lipid bilayer, shoved into a aqueous solution called cytosol, got a cell, we now have one. And that's another emergent property. Now, life wouldn't really be all that much fun if we couldn't react. And in fact, if you don't react to something, people are a lot of like, man, are you dead? So life is going to react to its surroundings. Now these surroundings, they can come from a variety of different things. It could be me turning the lights on and off, and so you're reacting to that stimuli of life. Uh, or you could also react to predators. If I had a bear right outside on the other side of the door and I let it in here, you're all probably going to react. And probably most of you are going to say, ah, oh, Bowen's such a jerk. But you're going to react to that. You're going to think about what you need to do. You're going to make a plan. And most of it's going to be really subconscious, to be perfectly honest. And Bryce Dillard's probably going to be pushing on all the girls. And <laughs> <laughs> so you can react to your surroundings. Life also requires this concept known as homeostasis, and I'm going to underline that. And homeostasis, the reason I'm underlining it, we're going to come back to it here in just a few minutes, it's because it is so dang important to physiology. In fact, homeostasis is basically what physiology is all about. So life requires homeostasis. We require the ability to maintain some sort of internal condition. You all have a body temperature that's maintained. You all have a blood uh, hydration level that's maintained. You have sodium levels that are maintained. You have potassium levels that are maintained. All of this stuff needs to be maintained. Collectively, that is known as homeostasis. Okay, what else does life require? Life requires 
reproduction. We must be able to reproduce. We must be able to develop. And we must be able to age. So reproduce, develop, and age. Uh, in other words, we have to be able to pass on our genetic material. We have to be able to pass on our genetic material. 